So, systems is a great idea to start this conference and these dialogues. And I was thinking about something that could come directly from our experience and that we could give to you. And I was thinking about systems in a very broad sense, in biology in general, not just to begin with the, the neural systems, which are, of course, the bread and butter of our life, uh, but the systems in general that support life. And so maybe we could start with this very simple idea, which is the idea of the problem of life. When you look, whether it is a cell, a single individual cell, or an organism such as ours, made up of very complex organs that are made up of tissues that are made up of cells, uh, you have something that all of these organisms face, which is the problem of life. Namely, the problem of respiration, the problem of digestion, the problem of making uh, all the elements that are coming from respiration and from the process of incorporating energy sources circulating in the system. And then the running of the entire system in a way that is compatible with life, which has to do with this great function for which there is an odd word which I invite you to think about, which is homeostasis. Most of what we're talking about in our daily lives is about homeostasis, which is about how do you regulate life? How do you regulate the processes that are necessary for our life in a way that is compatible with it continuing as long as our genome tells it that it should continue uh, and without self-destructing? Okay, so this is very, a very important problem. And the problem of systems appears at all of these levels. So, for example, if you have something like respiration, the idea that you have oxygen out there that you need in order to maintain the process, you need to capture it, you need to distribute it wherever it is needed to maintain life, uh, and that, that distribution, that capture and distribution and controlling of the process so that the whole thing does not destroy itself is governed by a system. In a single cell, it's very simple because you're dealing with just one single fairly close element that where things can be distributed and processed rather quickly and without great distances. But think of our body, think of the complexity of our body. When we incorporate oxygen through a respiratory system, we need to distribute that oxygen through a variety of tissues all over the body, which requires a circulation, a circulation of blood. And that in itself creates this systematic arrangement of anatomy, which is of course the core in which we all that we all inhabit, and that is a system of dependencies, a system of, of ranks of structure. Uh, take, for example, if you think about what circulation involves, we're not thinking yet about the complexities of the nervous system. Think about a heart that is necessary to move the blood. The heart is a simple pump. And yet, in order to move the blood, you require this circulatory system, which is one of channels, where the blood is going to circulate. But lo and behold, think of the beauty that they are not made all of the same caliber. They couldn't be or it wouldn't work well. They're made of different calibers with, uh, with vessels that branch and that branch into subsidiary levels that are progressively smaller and that have a lot to do with the branching of the trees that you can see outside through the window. You have a trunk, and then you have subsidiary branches, and branches that branch out, and you just have to realize how similar they are in terms of structure when you look at a map of blood vessels or a map of branches in a tree. Uh, now, the idea of homeostasis uh, is really very important because you know, not everything is possible within a living system, whether it is our own, the capability of movement that uh, is so characteristic of, of animals, or in systems that do not have the ability to move, such as the trees and plants that are all around us. And so because there are certain restrictions on what is permissible in order to maintain life, 
you're going to have certain rules that have to be obeyed. And that's what homeostasis is all about, is keeping the, the systems operating within certain ranges above which and below which life disappears and gives way to disease or to death. So homeostasis is a very important element to consider. And think of the fact that the evolution that we have had in living systems and the evolution that we have had in social systems through and through, through thick and through thin, aims at homeostasis. Everything that we seek to have, whether we're dealing about economy or a social structure or a political system or the world of the arts or the world of the technologies with which we govern uh, engineering or medicine, it's all about maintaining life within certain parameters that are compatible with its continuation. They're all about regulation. So this notion of homeostasis, or if you want, regulation of processes, uh, is absolutely critical. And don't think about it just in relation to a cell or to a simple biological system. Uh, think about it in relation to everything that surrounds us. It's an extremely important concept, and it is, of course, inseparable from the notion of system. If you take circulation, you know, hearts, blood vessels, blood pumping, distributing glucose and lipids and oxygen all over tissue so that they maintain alive, this is a very, very simple function. And you can see, you know, it has a lot to do with plumbing, has a lot to do with, with, uh, with tubes, uh, and you can, you can see it's patently obvious. You look at it the way like John Harvey did as a biologist, looking at these pumps and realizing what they have to do. With the nervous system, you've got something new that leads to something that emerges that is very important that we can call behavior and mind. And what comes from that, it's interesting. If you look at the nervous system, if you look at the brain and nerve trunks, and uh, uh, nerves in general, uh, pathways. It looks a lot like a blood circulation system where you have all these branches, you have second order branching and you have de uh, nodes and dependencies. Um, but there's something else that is very curious is that this is a system that appears late in evolution, appears late in evolution literally as a sort of copy and way of regulating all other systems. So it's not just one among the others. It's one that is literally above the others and that appeared in evolution when it was clearly no longer possible to grow unless something new would develop that would run herd over the other systems. That's what the nervous system is all about. Whether it is a simple nervous system in a little creature like a sponge or a big creature like humans. It's a system that runs herd over other systems. And it does so through the invention of a new kind of cell, which is the neuron. And neurons are, you know, we're not going to go into that right now, but we can talk about it. They're very different because they have not just a cell body like you have normally, but you have a cell body with this exotic prolongation called the axon, at the end of which there's this exotic thing called the synapse. And in between, there's this very exotic thing called the action potential, which is really electrical current that is going down the axon and is making the synapse fire, which really means both an electrical phenomenon and a chemical phenomenon because molecules of certain chemicals are being released at the synapse. This is astounding. It's completely different from all the other systems. You don't find this in the digest digestive system or respiratory or cardiac and circulatory. This is news. Okay. What this news gives you is not only regulation of movement, which is very important, regulation of behavior, very important too, but then something happened on the way to the party, which is that these systems are sensitive. These systems operate the way they do because they read the internal environment to begin with. 
and they detect changes such that new regulatory actions can be taken. They, they see a change in the stock market of a certain organ and they implement a change in the, in the main discount rate, okay? These are things that require this sensitivity which is best translated by the concept of sentience. They sense what is going on in the world. And this, my friends, is the origin of what we call these days, and we take for granted, mind. Mind is about a progression of sensitivities that comes all the way from neurons, and in my view, very, very specially from axons, this novelty, and that allows the emergence not only of behavior that is very regulatory and complex, but minds, internal minds that are really giving a quote-unquote picture of the world inside each and every one of ours. And that is really new. And everything that we talk about when we talk about education and our complex lives in society and about our history depends on the existence, on the pre-existence of this very complex phenomena of mind that comes from the very complex phenomena of the nervous system, that comes from the fact that nervous systems were necessary to regulate complex organisms the way that we have uh, talked about before. So there's this transition. In, in a way, we should be very plain and simple and say, okay, this is a nervous system and a brain is not unlike a circulatory system or a digestive system, and yet it is. It is more than that, and it's part of a hierarchy. It's way up there, and it is the open passport into all of the things that we hold dear in terms of our culture, including eventually language and the, the possibility that I have of standing here and telling you these things in English, and you're translating them into your mind language, so you have concepts that are being translated from my words, and we all end up in this common space, which is the space of our mind in a certain point in culture at the Ross School. Okay? Now we'll continue the conversation. Going on in the culture now, there, in this dialogue, there are two very radically different approaches. The one that I'm proposing, which is kind of like Celtic animism, that mind is actually even before the emergent neural activity. It's even more fundamentally basic. And in our primary system should be Lynn Margulis's, uh, you know, endosymbiotic theory of the emergent of the eukaryotic cell. And this, this overcomes not only the mind-body split, but the culture ecology split because if mind is immanental in the system and is a linkage with the environment, if we thought and lived that way, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. So, you know, the hierarchy is, is something that, you know, makes me give this sermon. Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes in the, in the sense that um, I'm firmly convinced that, for example, bacteria and uh, groups of bacteria behave socially and have an extremely complex life and have something that is a beginning of sentience. Whether or not they have, uh, I'm, I'm ready to give them the passport into mind is another story. There is sensitivity in fact, and that's the bridge to our sentience, um, but the, the, the representation is not there in the sense that it is in our minds. What there is is a series of elements that is prompting a series of behaviors that are already installed in the machine, and the machine then behaves accordingly given certain circumstances. But it's, it's, a, it's a very minimal difference, actually. It, it's both very important in the way you, one talks about it, but I think in the end, we're on the same continuum. It's just you know, where I put the border, you know, I, I sort of come down all the way to the border, but I'm not ready to go the last stretch because I don't think mind is there. But there is the continuity, and, and the reason why we can have a mind is that there are those creatures with all of this standard equipment in their, in their organisms.